Tonight, ABC anchor David Muir was in Ohio, gaining entry to a somber setting, the plane that carried Kennedy to Dallas 50 years ago. And then after those shots rang out, it became a kind of monument to a stun and change nation. And David Muir is here now. David. Diane, good evening to from what they call Kennedy's Air Force One. This is the plane that carried the president and the first lady. And right here behind me, this is the doorway. The president walked through one final time on that day in Dallas, waving to the thousands who were gathered there to see him. And as you point out tonight, we take you inside. The crowd yells, President and Kennedy the and the first lady the emerging States. from Air Force One at Love Field, 1963. Thousands waiting, so many holding signs. Welcome, Jack. We love you, Jackie. And looming over them in nearly every image, the presidential jet that would soon play a far more profound role. So this is it, Kennedy's Air Force One? This is Kennedy's Air Force One. The first Boeing designed for a president, but no one could have prepared for this. This is the aircraft that carried John Kennedy to Dallas, and this is the aircraft that carried his body back to Washington, D.C. You can see the cockpit. Today, they took us inside. The cockpit where President Kennedy's pilot, Colonel James Swindle, so often sat, seen there on the left, on the ground in Dallas less than an hour that day before learning the president had been shot. Audio from the cockpit. We have a request from uh, the chief of staff's office to know if you have uh, Mr. Johnson and uh, Mr. Kennedy's body aboard. I probably want uh, all of those questions. And is Mr. Kennedy on board? I probably want that. But before taking off, they would pull the shades. They actually close the shades. Yes, they close the shades because no one could tell if there's a sniper outside waiting for another shot or if this is the beginning of World War III. The 36th president about to be sworn in. This is where the moment took place. This is, this is the most important place on the entire aircraft. And Mrs. Kennedy stood right here, just at this very place. They were standing here. On board Air Force One. That was stifling. They had turned off the air conditioners that day so they could take off more as quickly. As quickly as possible, yes. And you could imagine the heat building in the plane. The heat and everyone's, their heart rate's up. And they're, they're breathing harder. This is their choking back tears. In that space, 16 square feet, 27 witnesses. And it was LBJ who asked Mrs. Kennedy if she would stand here for the oath as well. Yes. Standing in her blood-stained suit, Mrs. Kennedy wanted it that way. It's been said that she said they should see what they did. Yes, they should see what they did. And inside the stateroom on the plane, soon a new president at work. And the whole time, Mrs. Kennedy is in the back of the as plane. in the back of the aircraft. And she's with her husband. With the casket. With the casket. Sitting beside her husband's casket placed inside the cabin because the crew made sure of it. The flight crew refused to put the president's body below the cabin. Yes, the cargo hole is directly below us. They love the president and they refused to put his body in the cargo hole. Pulling out four seats, sawing into the bulkhead to get the president on board one last time. You know, it was really unmistakable today when they gave us access to Air Force One here, where they actually cut into the bulkhead. They never actually covered that up for several presidents who used this plane after President Kennedy. And one thing you learn here at the National Air Force Museum, Diane, on the outside of this plane, President Kennedy knew the power of an image, which is why he asked his wife, Jackie Kennedy, to team up with the designer. They chose the colors, the font for the United States of America that you still see traveling the globe today on Air Force One, Diane. Reaching across all those years, it is stunning to see you on board tonight, David. Thanks so much. And Tomorrow, the nation will pause to remember the dark day that changed history, the 50th anniversary of President Kennedy's assassination. And there is something Americans did not know. The president and his family once had a kind of secret bunker, a private island to protect them. President Kennedy and his wife, Jacqueline, were to hide there in the event of a tragedy. And ABC's anchor David Muir is there for us tonight to take us inside. David, hello. And what are we seeing behind you? Diane, good evening from the Kennedy bunker here on a man-made island just off the coast of Florida. You know, it took the Navy just a few days to build this bunker, and tonight we're taking you inside. The Kennedy family spent a lot of time here in Florida during his presidency at the so-called Winter White House in Palm Beach. But they were also aware of the quick route to this bunker. They practiced it, actually, living under the very real threat of the Cold War. They knew these tunnels made of corrugated steel were here for them. President Kennedy, forsaking the cares of state for a relaxing weekend on Cape Cod, is rushed by a toddler. This is the part of Camelot we knew about. Those cherished images of President Kennedy, his last summer with his children 50 years ago. 
Junior knows the ropes and is first aboard the copter. Those sunsplashed images of the presidential yacht, the Honey Fitz. Little Caroline on the president's lap, then down the stairs to share a swim with her dad. Just four months before she would lose him. A backstroke before getting back on board, her mother waiting, jumping back into the lap of her father. But behind those golden images, the black and white reality, the very real fears of the Cold War, the tense nuclear standoff with the Soviets, and away from the public eye, the secret bunkers being built for the president and his family. And he tested it. Yes, he did. Twice? Twice. Today, we took the short boat ride, the route President Kennedy took himself, 10 minutes door to door, from the so-called Winter White House in Palm Beach, Florida, to a bunker right once here. camouflaged so by trees 50 years ago. So this is the entrance. Built by the Navy in less than two weeks, yeah, protected by 12 feet of concrete and steel, yeah, the tunnels, the down. decontamination shower. They had enough for how many people? This was designed to hold 30 people for 30 days. Some of the original bunk beds still here, the transmitter ham radio, shelves stocked with survival kits. You can see the emergency drinking water they actually had down here. Back then it came in lead-lined cans, never would have been used today. Mrs. Kennedy knew of the shelters, and after her husband was shot, she wrote a letter. Dated December 1st, 1963, nine days after the assassination, to Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. Dear Mr. Chairman President, so now in one of the last nights I will spend in the White House, in one of the last letters I will write on this paper at the White House, I would like to write you my message. I send it only because I know how much my husband cared about peace. She goes on to write about the relationship they'd forged, the kindness the Khrushchevs had extended to them, and of Mrs. Khrushchev, I read that she had tears in her eyes when she left the American embassy in Moscow, signing the book of mourning. Please thank her for that. A fragile bond that kept those bunkers from view. And Diane, had this country come under attack and had they figured out that this was where the president and the first family were being kept safe, there was one more escape route. The president and the first lady could have climbed these stairs. This is the back of the bunker here. You can see the hatch at the top there, a secret escape to the outside world. Obviously, the bunker was never used. And in fact, the White House didn't even acknowledge that this existed until 10 years after his assassination, Diane. That was incredible to see. Thank you, David Muir.